good to see you. Um, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, probably sounds weird, uh, if, but there's a fair number of you that have glasses. I hate wearing glasses. Anybody with me? Um, I always have. I've had glasses since high school. But, but here's the challenge for me. I've always been on the cusp. And when I say I've always been on the cusp, I can see okay-ish without my glasses. But I've always just kind of been like, I, that, it just kind of tits me over the edge where I, I really, really do need them. And so at various times throughout my life, you probably have seen, like, see pictures. I don't have glasses on because if I needed glasses, I just did not wear them. But it is one of those things that has happened throughout the years that it has gotten a little bit more necessary. In fact, about five years ago, I went to the eye doctor and I, I realized that the distance, had, which has always been an issue, well, that, that was always an issue, but I was also having trouble reading books. Now, I could cheat because I could do this thing and, you know, I found that perfect place to be and like, I'm good. A couple of months ago, I realized that it was getting worse and worse. In fact, watching TV, like that's always been one of those things. If I can read the scores when I'm watching a, a football game, I'm good. But I found myself squinting more and more as I was watching sports. I was also finding that if I needed to like uh, find a specific street sign, I was slowing down really slow. And I was almost right up on it before I was able to read the street sign. So I uh, also could not read anything in a book. I had readers everywhere, all throughout my house, office, different things like that. And, and so I went to the eye doctor, and he said, yeah, you're getting at that age where you can't cheat anymore uh, with, with that. And uh, I, I put on, I, like after I got my glasses, I, I put them on for the very first time. It was as if angels were singing and birds were chirping, the sun was shining. I was like, wow, trees actually have leaves again instead of these green clumpish things everywhere. Uh, and and I, could, I could read, you know, like small print again, and it was glorious and good. See, it helped me see clearer, but I also realized when I was driving, I'm not slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. Oh, that's not good. I'm going to go to the next street. Uh, so it actually made life a little bit easier to have these, these things on my face, even though I really would rather not have them. See, we're talking about a worldview. We're actually talking about a biblical worldview. And a worldview is how you see the world. It's the lens by which you see the world in which you make decisions and make value judgments and different things like that. And so what we want to do is give you a, a view of how God created the world, how He sees the world, but in, in doing so, we want your life to be easier. We want you to be able to walk with Jesus. So one of the challenges in our world, in the United States of America, is probably one of the hardest areas in the world because we're such a conglomerate of people, we have all of these different worldviews converging. And so I, I'm going to start with the biblical worldview, and I'm actually going to give you a statement. I did not write this statement, but it was a pretty good statement that this is kind of the, the basis of a biblical worldview. The triune God, in other words, God in three persons, Trinity, created all, and restores us by grace through faith in Jesus. That's kind of the beginning point. That kind of sums everything up. We're going to kind of build on this over the next several weeks. But I do want to say that there are a lot of different worldviews out there. Uh, one of them is deism. Deism believes in a creator, believes that there was a God, but after he did all that he needed to do, he kind of left left us without direction and different things like that. There's also nihilism, and nihilism is that there is no ultimate truth. We can't really know anything. Um, basically, whenever I die, nihilists will just basically believe you cease to exist. There's no afterlife whatsoever. Um, there's existentialism. Existentialism really means that we create our own truth and meaning. That's pretty old, but we, we see a lot of that in our world today. New Age spirituality. I, I had to mention this one because we live in New Mexico. All right? And so it's kind of a big thing. But New Age spirituality is kind of like 
it's, you see the coexist bumper stickers? That's the, I would say that that's New Age, uh, uh, new age worldview or this uh, New Age spirituality because it's a little bit of Eastern, it's a little bit of, of Western, it's a little bit of, of Islam, a little bit of this, a little bit of this, and you just kind of put it all in the blender together and whatever comes out, comes out. And, and we find that even in our world today, you find a little bit of stuff from the East, a little bit of Native American stuff, a little bit of Christianity, and it's just all kind of blended together. And there's also postmodernism. That is probably a predominant worldview in America today. Uh, it's, it, truth does not exist, and the, the truth that is, uh, is in our culture is created by power structures to control us. But it's best to, in fact, you've maybe heard this term before, I'm just living my truth. In other words, truth is whatever I want it to be. Now the problem is not just have all these different worldviews. Uh, it, it came out uh, this last year, 37% of pastors, 37% of pastors have a, quote, biblical worldview. 22% of church members. And, and so basically, that, that means that every decision, everything is made from the standpoint of the Bible. And I'm going to say that most of the people that have... Um, that, that, that don't have a biblical worldview, that are within the church, within the ministry, it's because of syncretism. It's because they'll say things like, well, yeah, I believe the Bible and all, I think it is good and so on, but doesn't God want me to be happy? And, and basically, that's individualism. You know, and by the way, that's First Opinions 1-1. That did not make the cut to get into the Bible. All right? So doesn't God want me to be happy? That is, again, how individualism would come in. There's also the idea, and this finds its way even into churches, and their message is, you know, God is good, the, the Bible is true, and also God wants you to have nice things. He wants you to be very wealthy. And, and I, I always say that for something to be true, it has to be universally true. And so therefore, God wants you to drive a Mercedes it has to be true, with the, the family in Africa or India that's having two cups of rice a day for a, for a family. That has to be universally true with them. But also, uh, probably a big one in our world today is nationalism. In other words, like we believe the Bible, the Bible's God's good word, etc., etc. But what really matters most is protecting our nation. And I think we should be protecting it. But uh, you understand where nationalism would come in, where we would almost worship nation as much as we worship God. And that can be very, very dangerous. And I'll even go as far as to say what's dangerous sometimes, whether it's individualism or nationalism, is we don't know where the biblical worldview ends and our other worldviews start. And so we are in kind of a quandary. So we're going to talk about a biblical worldview. We're going to talk about the idea that the triune God created all that we see and do not see and saves us through faith in His Son, Jesus. That's where we're, we're going to kind of land here today. But last week we asked a big question. In fact, Kyle, I think, answered this question incredibly well. And the question that he asked is, can we trust the Bible? If we're going to have a biblical worldview, we have to say, do, can we trust the Bible? He laid out great. If, if you didn't get to catch it, get on bv.church and, and, and catch that message. Really, really good stuff. But I want to ask another question here today. And the question is, who am I? I believe that this is an existential question that uh, many people will end up asking in their lives. Like, who am I? I don't, like, and, 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 and kind of as a follow-up question, we're going to actually dig into this one first, is... Where do we come from? Where did this all start? And I, I think these are important sort of things. In fact, one of the, the things I think is, is dangerous when we do biblical worldview and do sermon series like this is we, we, wanna, we sometimes want to be right. We want to prove everyone else wrong. And that's not the purpose here. We want to help everybody love and follow Jesus with head, heart, and hands. That's really what we want people to be able to do. So this isn't about proving to our neighbor that my worldview is better than your worldview. This is ultimately about following Jesus and, and really having a good foundation as we do. So we're going to begin. Uh, we're going to begin in the beginning. 
And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1. If you'd like to use one of the Bibles in the seats in front of you, it's going to be real easy. It's page 1. <laughs> That's where we're starting. Uh, and so also in the little link tree, the little QR code thing, there's a, a Bible app, a uh, Bible little section there. And I know when I hit it, it took me right to my Bible app and right to Genesis 1. Uh, so we're going to read the first five verses. It says this, In the beginning... God created the heavens uh, and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness uh, he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So I want to kind of begin as we talk about the, the idea of creation. God is the originator of creation. He is our creator. Uh, I, I want to put it like this, not chaos but order, not accident but purpose, not question mark but God. Uh, that's, that's kind of where I, I landed in my mind as I went through things this week and, 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 and just kind of as uh, just in general with where, where I stand. And when we talk about creation, it's always a tough thing because people land differently on creation. And, and I'll even go as far as to say that the, in this room right now, I know that there are probably differing views. And uh, what, one, of, one of the things we'll talk about in church sometimes is there's young earthers that will look at the age of the earth as seven to 10,000 years old. And then there are old earthers, and we get into millions and billions and different things like that. Now, I have friends that differ from me. I will tell you, uh, about 20 years ago, I kind of came to a faith conclusion. My faith conclusion was based on the Hebrew word yom. Anybody know what yom is? Anybody know what yom kippur is? Yom kippur is day of atonement, Right? So yom is the word for day. And so when it says there was evening, there was morning, day one, I just took the, to say I'm going to make a faith decision to say I am a young earther. Now, I have friends who are followers of Jesus, who love Jesus, that are old earthers. And I'm just going to tell you, if I'm wrong about the young earth when I get to heaven, I will change my mind. Okay, and same thing with you. If you're an old earther and you get to heaven and it's a young earth, you will change your mind. All right, that's, that's the reality. But I do go back to not chaos but order, not accident but purpose, not question mark but God. That in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And one of the things I think is interesting is the order of creation. That there are seven days in creation there are seven or there are six days that god was creative and then there was a day of rest and I, I think there's something interesting about even just the order of creation it's actually 1929 uh, the soviets uh, had a grand experiment it's before world war ii before the cold war the soviets had the idea that let's create a five-day work week and so they created a calendar over five days and eventually they they said well what about a 10-day work week but what they did on this five-day work week there was no weekend and at any given time 20 percent of the workforce was off but that didn't necessarily mean if husband and wife were working they were going to be off at the same time and here's one of the things that they discovered after this this experiment is that productivity did not go up it went down and some people say, well, why would that be? And I happen to say, because God created us for rest. He created creation for rest. I, my grandpa was a farmer, and I, I, it was either half the time the, the, the land was, was lying fallow, or every third or fourth year it would lie fallow, because he was not a believer, he was not a Christian, but yet I remember him saying, well, you know, God created the world to rest. So there's certain things in the order of creation that's kind of interesting. And, and so I believe that God has created us for a day of rest. 
I'll tell you this, about five years ago, I crashed. I was burnt out. I was on the edge. And one of the things that was not part of my life then and is now is rest. Learning how to, to be in, in, in that rhythm with God. But let's ask a theological question. What does it mean that God is our creator? Uh, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. This is God talking. All souls are mine. The soul of the Father is, as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. So God, right out of the gate, says, souls belong to me. Now, you probably heard the big church word sovereignty or sovereign. It means that God owns everything, that He has authority over everything. And here's the deal. He has authority over everything because He's the creator of everything. If He's not the creator, He does not have authority. And if He doesn't have um, a, a, a authority in this, here's something that we have to say. He doesn't have the authority to punish sin. But here's one of the things that a Bible teacher used to say when I was in Bible college. If God is not your creator, he has no ownership over you, so therefore he cannot be your redeemer. He doesn't have the authority to forgive sin. So that's a big thing about the idea of, of where do we come from and why is it important to put God as the originator, the, the, the creator of all that we see and do not see. So let's now ask the question, who am I? That's a big question. And starting point is very important. Now I'm going to say something. And as I say this here today, I want to say this with compassion. I want to say this with sincerity. But in our world right now, People are either confused with who am I or they worship it or both. I'll even go as far as to say maybe our biggest idol today is identity. And part of the things that we find is the more boxes we can check in who we are, the better person we are. But then also we have a voice in our culture that is saying if you don't like who you are, you don't like your identity, make a new one. And I go back to, I go back to when God says, all souls are mine. I mean, that means that my identity is wrapped up in the fact that God owns me and he created me. Uh, I love the fact that we sang who you say I am this morning. One of my favorite songs to sing, because I think there's something intrinsically valuable when we understand that we are created by God. And there's actually, uh, you may know who Lauren Daigle is. Lauren Daigle's a, a Christian song artist. She had a song called You Say, and it really like, you know, you say I am this, you know what I'm saying? It's basically a, a prayer to God saying, you get to say who I am. Do you know how long that song was at number one on the Billboard charts? A hundred weeks. You know, uh, uh, Bart Millard, who is the Mercy Me guy, you know, I can only imagine, he calls that the Daigle. You know, you, you, everybody, uh, she's like in a category all herself. But that, the fact of the matter is that it's tied to creation ought to tell us something. In fact, let's go ahead and, and read on in Genesis chapter 1. I want to read verses 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, when God says, let us make man... There's a couple of opinions. One is that this is kingly language, like he's the king of creation, and so he refers to himself in, in the plural form. I don't know that that's necessarily it. I, I think it's more that this is the triune God, this is the Trinity being expressed right here, right out of the gate in the Bible. Let us make, God, let us make man in, in our image and after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and, and over the livestock and over the earth and every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. Now, I'm just going to tell you, I hate that statement um, because I hate those little creepy things that creep <laughs> on the earth. Like um, even a snake that big will, will send me into, um, well, I might scream. 
So then verse 27, so God created man in his own image, and in, in the image of God he created him, and male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I, I, I have given you every plant yielding seed, that is on uh, the face of the earth, and every tree with seed uh, and its fruit, you shall have food for them. And every beast of the earth, and, uh, and to every bird in the heavens, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life. I have given um, every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that uh, everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. It, it wasn't until man came into picture, humanity came into picture, that God then said, everything else got good, but when, when humanity enters the picture, it is, this is very good. This is, this is, this is very good. And, and so, uh, I, I want to reiterate uh, something, but before we do, let's look at verse 27 again. So, God created man in his own image, and the image of God, he created them Male and female, he created them. Uh, one of the things that, um, it's actually called, I think, discourse analysis. But as you're reading the Bible, what you're looking for is repeated terms and repeated words and repeated phrases. So if you get into like a verse, like verse 27, and it says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. The word image comes up twice, and creation is three times. And so that is, there's an emphasis here in what God did. And so God as creator is important, but image of God is important. So I reiterate, not chaos but order, and not accident but purpose, not question mark but God. And so I want to introduce a term, and the term here is the Latin term for image of God. It's called imago Dei. You might be reading a book or might hear... Uh, somebody say, imago Dei. That's the image of God. What does it mean that we are the image of God? Uh, I, I think one of the things that we have to say as a result of creation, I did not come from chaos but from order. And so my life does not have to be one of confusion. It does not have to be one of chaos. There can be order and, and certainty. Uh, as a result of creation, uh, my life is not an accident. You know, I'll, I'll you go as far as to say this. I, I heard a preacher say this one time, um, and he was kind of joking. He was a, like a revival speaker, guest speaker in the church, and he said, you know, I have like a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 16-year-old, and an oops. <laughs> um, you know, and he was basically saying, yeah, we had a, one of those change-of-life babies, and, and sometimes those come along. But even that that's an oops for us is never a mistake to God. Never an accident to God. And, and so we have to understand. And by, by with that, I, I, I realize I'm here for a purpose. I have a cause to live by. And, and I can live for the glory of God. And, and also as a result of, of creation, I don't have to live with a question mark. Uh, there's a lot of people walking around saying, I don't know why we're here. There's a lot of people walking around that like they're, they're still trying to figure things out. I have to say that, you know, God is the, you know, the immovable mover. He is the uncausable cause that kind of comes into this. When God is in the picture, I don't have to live with a question mark. I can live with certainty. And so the idea of Imago Dei is important. And here's why it's important. I'm actually listening to a podcast right now. A friend of mine, Perry, um, he was uh, the son of our founding pastor. He's listening to a podcast this year from a Catholic priest. It's called A Year Through the Bible. And I started listening to it, and it's really, really good. But this Catholic priest made the, the comment that of all the worldviews that are out there, of Islam and, and, and Hinduism and Buddhism and all the different views of the world that are out there, Judeo-Christian worldview is the only one that claims image of God. That's a special thing. That is an amazing thing. In fact, we have to ask what separates like us as the image of God from all other created things. Uh, Psalm 8 is a great example of this. Psalm 8 is, um, I actually did a paper on this uh, probably in 19, early, early 1990-something 
in what was called um, Hebrew uh, wisdom literature. You, know, you all remember that class? Okay, Dr. Halen and, and so on. I did a paper on this, but I said, look at verse 3. When I look at your heavens, David, this is King David, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. Think about this. I mean, David is like, he's mesmerized by creation, but yet he is amazed at where we as humanity are in the order of creation. Like where God puts us there. Like, I, I love living in New Mexico. I don't know that I would want to live anywhere else at least at this point in time in my life. But here's one of the things I love about New Mexico, low humidity. I didn't grow up this way, but when I have to go back to Kansas and go see my parents in Arkansas and go back to Texas, I am dying when I'm around humidity. Like, this is the worst thing in the world. Um, but when I think about this, I, I love New Mexico because the thing that I, it just amazes me almost more than anything else is the handiwork of God through the stars in the sky. Like, we have awesome sunsets, and for those of you who don't get up in the morning, just take my word for it, our sunrises are pretty amazing too. But the stars are amazing. They're so bright, they're so clear. And to think that God, it's His handiwork, it's what He did, what's he, what He's done. But here's the thing. They aren't crowned with glory and honor. We are. That almost brings tears to my eyes. We are crowned with glory and honor. Not those things that we are in awe over. It's us. That's a pretty special thing. So let's really kind of ask that question again, though. What does it mean that we are in the image of God? Why are we crowned with glory and honor? We are made in the image of God, but here's the reality. We don't look like God because God is spirit. So it's got to be something else. So I'm just going to rattle off a couple of items here today that I, I think really kind of instill the word, the, the image of God into us. Number one, we have different mental capacity than all other living creatures. We really, really do. Now, I've been around some teenagers at times that has drawn this into question, but the reality is we are created in the image of God, and by virtue of that, we have a different mental capacity. Think about math here for a moment. You know, one of the things that I love about being able to go to Bible college when I was right out of high school uh, is the fact of the matter is there was only one math class required and only one science class required. Uh, a lot of theology, a lot of papers, a lot of different things like that, and it was pretty simple math. I'm good with that. But here's the thing. Simple math or complex, well, we're able to reason, and we're able to think, and we're able to problem solve, and we're able to communicate, and we're able to collaborate. You know, that sort of thing, uh, even math, simple math, is an expression of the image of God. I would say most of us got here today via a vehicle. That vehicle was made by someone. It was designed by someone. That is an expression of the image of God. And art and music and literature, whether we even know it or not, these are all expressions of Imago Dei that God has given us. You know, I have not seen any animals in any you know, length of time be able to create art or make music or anything like that. And every once in a while in America's Got Talent, they have that pet act, right? But it's very, very basic. We bear the image of God because of our mental capacity, but we also, uh, we're able to make moral, and, uh, moral decisions and judgments. And that is something that is inside of us. I, I love Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 25 when it talks about Adam and Eve. It says, and they were naked and they felt no shame. That was a time where there was innocence and righteousness all throughout the world. Now sin eventually entered the picture, but it was good. But after sin, after the, you know, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God is walking through the Garden of Eden. Adam, Eve, 
Where are you? Oh, we're hiding. Why are you hiding? Because we're naked. Who told you? Well, there's that knowledge of good and evil that came in the picture. Even think about how did Abel know that it was the right thing to sacrifice to God? How did Cain know that after he murdered Abel that instinctively I flee? Has anybody ever lied to you? Anybody ever lied about you? I, there's just something inside of us that says, that's wrong. Ever heard of a horrific crime? It, you don't have to think about it. You just know that is wrong. Where does that come from? I love Ecclesiastes chapter 3. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it says, He has made everything beautiful in His time. He had just talked about for every, you know, every season, there, you know, there's a time. But then He goes on to say, also, he has put eternity in the hearts in man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. There's still mystery to God. There's still things that we can't fathom or know about God. I actually had a professor that said if we knew everything that there was to know about God, and if we were able to see God, we would not be able to live. And there's going to be a time in eternity if you're a follower of Jesus that you will continually be in the presence of God and you will continually know and grow in your knowledge of who He is. There's certain things beyond our, our minds today. However, He's still put eternity in our hearts. I saw this one time. I was talking to a gentleman. He used to come to church here before he moved away. But the first time he came to church here was the first time he had ever been inside a church. A friend invited him. And like, he was probably one of the first people, if not the first person I ever met, like he had zero knowledge. He grew up about 90 minutes from me uh, in, in western Kansas. He was actually from southern, uh, south central Kansas. But he's from one of those towns that he went to church at least twice a year. And so I was like, did you not go on Christmas and Easter? Because even bad people where I grew up, they went to church on Christmas and Easter. That's just what you did. And he's like, no, I, I grew up in a house. That there was never a mention of God. There was never a mention of church. There was never even a those people are crazy sort of thing. But he said, I was, I was working on a car and I did something stupid and didn't you know, chain things up the way it should have been. And part of an engine fell on me. And I was lying there on the ground and I thought I was going to die. And I cried out to God for help. And he said, I don't know where that came from because I didn't believe that there was a God. Could it be that God has created eternity in our hearts? And the breath, you know, he breathed breath into Adam. That's where that came from. Actually, it tells us in Romans, everything that needs to be known about God is plainly seen, even in creation. And so we find this. I mean, why do we call something good? Why do we feel guilt? Why do we know that something is wrong? Can we just say that there's something inside of us? We want to call this a moral compass. I say God has created eternity in our hearts. But there's also this. We are social beings in need of fellowship. We, the, the only time God in creation said it's not good is when man was alone. And so whether we know it or not, when we go to a wedding and we see a, a couple uh, become husband and wife, this is an expression of imago Dei, that, that need for fellowship. When we hang out with one another, when we share a meal with one another, uh, when we hurt for another person and, and we have joy with another person, that's an expression of imago Dei. I, I, I think about this, I, I can't wait for probably Thursday by the time we, we get there, but Wednesday we're going to leave to head up to Kansas to take care of our grandkids for eight days, maybe too long. But we have four grandkids, and one that actually likes me the most. So Austin is the baby, he's about 16 months old. If I'm in the room, he wants me. 
And so if I walk in the room, he's holding up his arms. He's walking over to me. He wants to sit in my lap. We play. We hang out. He's my buddy. That's an expression of Imago Dei. That connection with people. Something God has created inside of us. So let me just say it like this. This is our bottom line. Imago Dei gives human life greater dignity and value. We are crowned with glory and honor. What happens when you remove Imago Dei? Romans 1 actually talks about this. Romans 1, uh, starting with verse 18, and, and it, it, it gives us a couple of things. I'll just kind of just share a few things. We exchange the truth of God for a lie. We, we, we buy into deception. Also, though, we start worshiping creation rather than the creator. What's the messaging of our world today? The value is not in people. The value is in the planet. We can save the planet and not save people and people will go to hell. Also, there comes a point when we remove Imago Day that God says, you're on your own. Gives us over. And basically... I think there's a little switch that is flipped off. You know, that little thing inside that says, hey, this is wrong, goes away. And so therefore, we use the, the creative capacity that God has instilled inside of us to create perverted things. It's as if when we remove Imago Dei, we act as if there is no God. That's the challenge. That's the problem. And so with that, a couple of personal challenges to everybody this week. We talked about this, and we'll be doing this at least throughout this year, maybe moving forward. We want to, in every sermon, give a head challenge, heart challenge, and a hands challenge. Here's the head challenge. Read Genesis 1 and 2, as well as Psalm 8 this week. And as you do, ask the question, God, what are you teaching me about you, and what are you teaching me about me? Now, I'm also going to borrow from, my kids will be very proud of me for doing this. I want to borrow from um, Bob and Larry and VeggieTales. Remember what was in VeggieTales? God made you special and loves you very much. Embrace the idea that God made you special and loves you very much. David, as he was thinking about his life, said this, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. As you watched me as I was being formed, uh, uh, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw, uh, saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day passed. And finally this. Treat every person you encounter as though they bear the image of God. That God made them special and loves them very much. Will you join me in prayer?